And welcome to Krishna in Vrindavan. So um, today we're going to be looking at Canto 10, Chapter 22, Krishna Steals the Gopi's Garments. So Krishna, 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 hey. Krishna, 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 hey. Krishna, 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 Raksha, Krishna, 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 Pahima, Rama, Raghava, Rama, Raghava, Rama, Raghava, Raksha, Mam, Krishna, Keshava, Krishna, Keshava, Krishna, Keshava, Pahima, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So this story is um, it's very interesting and a funny story. <laughs> There's a lot of um, dramatic tension in this story. Um, but in order to understand it correctly, we need to um, uh, understand it in the context of the culture <clears throat> in which it took place. So the culture at that time, this is... Um, over 5,000 years ago in India. And uh, at that time, the dealings between men and women were very strict, especially con compared to uh, Western standards nowadays. So the women were very modest and shy. And they basically, there was practically no talking uh, between boys and girls, uh, only between husband and wife or, you know, brothers and sisters or you know, if it was an emergency or something like that, but otherwise, no. So that's, uh, the girls were so shy that they, they just absolutely would never um, approach a boy. And even the boys were very um, self-controlled and so they wouldn't go and uh, talk to a girl. So we have to understand, un uh, getting a sense of that helps us understand the intensity of this pastime. So then what happens is, um, the um, gopis, we've been hearing about how the gopis have been uh, watching Krishna when he comes home from the pasturing grounds and, uh, you know, being very attracted to him and looking out of the corner of their eyes or just like covering their heads with the end of the saris or their veils and just sort of peeking through the cloth <laughs> um, and uh, smiling shyly like that. And then more recently, we heard how when Krishna plays the flute, then their hearts completely melt and they can't talk about Krishna, although they want to. So they just glorify his flute and the effects that it has on all the moving and non-moving, living and non-living residents of Vrindavan. So now uh, the gopis, uh, their mothers approach them and they say that my, my dear daughter, uh, it's getting to be time where you need to start thinking of marriage. And of course, you want to get a good husband. So the custom is for unmarried girls to worship um, this demigoddess named Katyayani, <clears throat> who is a form of Durga Devi. So they would do this rut, which was a month long uh, vow, where they would go every day before sunrise and bathe in the Yamuna. And they would make, um, they would make a, a deity out of the, the clay, the earth, basically and then worship that deity of Durga Devi by offerings. And they would offer um, you know, flowers and incense and, and nice leaves from auspicious trees and fruits and things that they found there in the forest. And they would pray to get a good husband. But of course the gopis, they were only attracted to Krishna. They had no thought of marrying any other boy. So when they're worshiping Durga Devi, their prayer was, um, Get Krishna as their husband. So uh, I'll read a little bit. So starting from text one. During the first month of the winter season, the unmarried young unmarried girls of Gokul observed a vow of worshiping goddess Katyayani. For the entire month, they ate only unspiced kitri. Yeah, so that's another part of this vow, that the only thing they eat is um, uh, unspiced kitri means you just take mung dal and rice and boil it in water until it's soft. And that's it. <laughs> no spices, no vegetables, no even salt. 
no ghee, no butter, no oil, nothing. So just rice and dal. And that they eat only once a day. So they were doing this for one whole month. And uh, so they would wake up early in the morning before sunrise and they would um, call each other. They would all assemble together at a designated area. And then they had to go uh, pass through the forest and it's still in the dark before dawn. So they would be holding their, each other's hands and walking along. And as they're going, as soon as they got out of earshot of the villagers, as soon as they entered the forest, they would just start singing the glories of Krishna. So this um, could very well be the first ever Harinam procession. That these gopis are walking through the forest all together and they're singing the names of Krishna and the glories of Krishna as they go. So then they get there, they bathe in the Yamuna, they make their deity and they make their offerings. And then uh, yeah, they, they would chant this. Um, oh, and this is the mantra that they would chant. So text four is the mantra that they would chant. Katyayani Mahamaye Mahayogin Yadhishvari Nanda Gopa Sutam Devi Patim Me Kurute Namaha. Iti mantram japantyasta pujam chakru kumarikaha. So the first four lines of their mantra that uh, katyayani katya yani mahamaye. That, oh goddess uh, katyayani. Uh, mahamaye means oh great potency. <clears throat> Mahayogini means possessor of great mystic power. And Adishri means almighty oh, controller. So they're glorifying her that. Um, you have so much potency and mystic and all mystic powers and you're also a controller so please use your powers and whatever you know control you have over anything and your potencies to make krishna our husband nanda gopa sutam and that, that son of uh, that son of uh, nanda maraj pati me kurute namaha please make him our husband we are offering our obeisances to you for this. So that's their prayer. And somebody might wonder, well, if these um, girls, gopis of Vrindavan, are nitya siddhas, that they're eternally liberated devotees of Krishna, then why are they worshipping Durga Devi, who is a demigoddess? Because as the devotees aren't supposed to worship demigods, at least that's what we learn in ISKCON, right? We worship only Krishna, Radha, Krishna, Gornitai, Vishnu Tattva and their eternal consorts, we don't uh, worship demigods. So the Acharyas comment that the um, this form of um, Durga Devi is actually um, not the demigoddess Durga Devi, but is Yoga Maya. So she's not really Maha Maya, but she's Yoga Maya. And so um, Yoga Maya is the one who makes Krishna's pastimes happen. So she, she, they're praying to her, oh, Yoga Maya, you know, you uh, are able to make all of Krishna's pastimes perfect. So please pr make this pastime perfect that we marry Krishna. And another reason is because um, Yoga Maya covers over people's um, intelli their knowledge of things. So another reason they're um, approaching Yoga Maya is because they want her to... Um, cover over their parents' intelligence so they don't get to know about um, their desire to marry Krishna or their marriage to Krishna. They want it to be a secret. So um, like that, they're praying. And even if they were worshiping the Mahamaya or Durga Devi, because they're only asking for Krishna, that they're not asking for anything material, then that's also not, um, it's not, um, incompatible with the process of bhakti. So, you know, like Prabhupada said that even Lord Shiva, we can worship as the greatest Vaishnava and pray to him to help us to become also pure devotees of Krishna. Or we can pray to um, like um, Ganapati, Ganesh, to remove the obstacles that might impede us from approaching Krishna. But we should never ask them for material things. Our goal should be only Krishna. And that was the goal of the 
gopis. So they did this for a whole month and their, their minds were completely absorbed in Krishna during that whole time. And uh, so then uh, the time came that the last day of the month, it would be like the closing ceremony. Today at Krishna House, they had the closing ceremony for their Kirtan Connections course. So it was like a big event and um, they wanted everyone to be there. So they um, they invited some of the VIP gopis to be there, like Radharani and Lalita and Vishaka, and to, to um, you know, support them and encourage them and give their blessings. So the, the older gopi girls were there. And these older gopi girls were already married, but the younger girls were not married. These were little girls. <clears throat> and so they wanted the blessings of their older, the older girls. And so then the, the young girls, they put their, um, they had, after they did the rituals, they had to take like a, a ceremonial bath. That would be the completion of the ceremony. The last thing that they had to do was their bath. So um, they prepared for that and they got in the water very prayerfully. Now this, the time was um, the month right after Kartik, this Katyayani Rat. So if anybody wants to have a, a good husband <laughs> can do the Kadyayani Rod soon. It starts the day after Kartik. So when Kartik uh, finishes, then the next day Kadyayani Rod begins. I have some friends who did this. <laughs> uh, and uh, they did get husbands, I guess they're okay. <laughs> but anyways, um, so at the end of the day, they, they had to do the ceremonial bathing. And Krishna being the Supreme Personality of Godhead and being totally omniscient, he knew that it was the last day of their vow. So the place where they were bathing, uh, in those days, they had, um, you know, they didn't have bathrooms in the house. Everybody would bathe in the river. So they had designated places that the ladies would bathe in this area of the river and the men would bathe in another place so that they were just further, far enough away that they were out of sight from each other. And still it's like that in India. When you go to holy places and the bathing ghats, be, ladies will be one side, men will be another area. So uh, that's how it was. And it was just respected, you know, that men would never even think about going into going to the, the women's bathing area. So because of because there was that respect and that consideration for each other, you know, then um, the girls weren't afraid of bathing naked in the water. And then that was like, uh, in one way, it was more convenient because they didn't need to carry, you know, bathing clothes. They didn't need to worry about their wet clothes afterwards. It simplified things. So uh, they went into the water and they left their clothes on the riverbank. And they're in there, you know, dunking three times under the water and saying their prayers and, you know, praying intensely now because this is the, the time when it's finished and they're hoping to get the results of the vow, hoping to get Krishna as their husband. And they're praying very intensely to Yoga Maya, please make this happen. Please arrange our marriage with Krishna. And so Krishna, he, he hears their prayers. He knows that what they want. And so he goes there and he sneaks in in such a way that they don't know that he's there. But Krishna is not alone. <laughs> he's accompanied uh, by some friends. So, um, one might think, well, how is it that Krishna is bringing some friends there because these other boys are going to see the gopis naked and that can't happen? So the acharyas explain that the, the, the boys that Krishna brings with him, they're just little boys. They're like only a two or three years old. They're like toddlers, <laughs> so tiny little boys who, who don't even uh, understand the difference between uh, male and female. And they have no you know, concept of anything related to that so and they can't even talk so there's no there's no um, danger that they're going to go home and tell their parents they're so small like that so then krishna goes with his little um following of uh little boys and krishna goes very he stealthily and he just scoops up all of the clothes in his arm and climbs up the tree so when krishna does that then the little boys all start laughing because he looks just like a monkey. You know, the monkeys of Vrindavan do that. They creep in very quietly. They get something that you left and they go straight up in the tree very quick. 
So the little boys are giggling seeing Krishna do this mischievous uh, act. And when the, they hear the, then the gopis, they turn around and look like, who's there? And they see these little boys giggling and pointing and looking up in the tree. And they look up in the tree and there's Krishna. So for the gopis, this is like um, very big. <laughs> this is like a, a very um, uh, intense moment for them because all month they've been praying for Krishna. And now on the day that they finish their vow, there is Krishna. But um, so internally, they're overjoyed. They're like absolutely thrilled that Krishna has come. But externally, um, they're at least feigning annoyance. You know that Krishna took our clothes. You know, he, what is he even doing here? He's not even supposed to be here. And what's worse, he's taken our clothes. So now what are we going to do? And, uh, you know, it's November, December. It's, it's getting cold. The water is cold. We don't want to, we can't stay in here. We're like shivering. We're turning, our lips are turning blue from being in this cold water. But now, because they have this shyness, you know, that the shyness of the girls is so strong that uh, they, they, they actually want to come out. You know, they want to, they've been hankering for this, um, relationship with Krishna, but their shyness doesn't allow them. So this is like a test, actually, that Krishna is testing this, the power of their love. So you could think of like a, a river that's a very deep and strong river that's flowing. And then there's, it comes to a dam. You've built this very strong dam. So the river wants to flow, but it's just, um, you know, it's just dammed up. And uh, maybe you know, usually when there's a dam, of course, the river can't be totally stopped. Generally, if it's a very, you know, voluminous river, uh, it will be channeled off. You know, maybe some water will be channeled off to supply the water needs of the town and city like that. So, but it's not allowed to flow straight in the direction that it wants to flow. So the gopis' love for Krishna is like this deep, powerful river. And their shyness is, is, a, is the dam that's holding it back. So they're in the water and they have so much love for Krishna. They actually want to come out and interact with Krishna. And Krishna's whole idea is that, all right, these gopis are asking me to be their husband, but they want me to marry them in such a way that, that their parents don't know. So how am I going to do that? Because, uh, you know, weddings are a big event. You know, everybody, it's not something that you do in secret. And especially in India, the weddings are like huge thing that go on for multiple days and uh, the whole village takes part in it. You know, if you're in a small village, everybody knows everybody's there and invite all their friends and family and everybody gets dressed up and it's a whole big thing. So um, he said, I have to marry them in a way that nobody knows. So there can't be any ceremony. And he said, okay. That's why he brought the little boys, because there needs to be a witness, you know, like even if you just get like a, a legal court marriage, you need to have two witnesses. So Krishna brought his witnesses, <laughs> those little toddlers. And then uh, so in the Vedic, called Vedic society, there are different kinds of marriages. There's the um, Brahmin marriage and there's the Gandharva marriage and the Rakshasa marriage and uh, so there are different, different kinds of marriage. I think there's like seven or nine different types of ways that um, things can go on in such a way that the two are considered husband and wife after that. And one of the things is that if the man sees the woman naked, so Krishna's like, okay, <laughs> I know they're going to be bathing naked. I know they want me as their husband. They don't want their parents to find out. So this is the solution. <laughs> I'm going to go there. And uh, by seeing them naked, because only the husband can see the wife naked. So if he's thinking, if I see them naked, that means I must be their husband. And that's a way of accepting them as uh, his wives. So that was the plan. But the gopis, of course, then they, they had this barrier of shyness. So they couldn't come out. So they're pleading with Krishna, please, Krishna, don't do this to us. You know, we're religious girls and you also you know you, you you know religious principles you know this is what not the right thing to do and why are you put is putting us in such an awkward situation this is really embarrassing we're really cold here we need to come out and you need to give our clothes back but krishna's like nope 
I'm not giving your clothes back. You need to come out. And he wants them to come out one by one. So then <laughs> the gopis, they're like, they're really torn between their, um, you know, their, their social sense, you know, there's sobriety that's because of their upbringing in that society and their, their hearts, you know, their hearts just want to go out there and run to Krishna. So then uh, they're, and they're thinking it's really funny, like just the way that Krishna is, is joking with them and teasing them. I'm going to read some parts here that Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur uh, comments. And the whole time, they're just, everyone's just laughing. Krishna's laughing. His, the little boys there are laughing. The girls are also laughing. And uh, yeah, so let's see. I'm reading from the purport here, text 12. It says, seeing how, this is the verse, seeing how Krishna was joking with them, the gopis became fully immersed in love for him. And as they glanced at each other, they began to laugh and joke among themselves even in their embarrassment, but still they did not come out of the water. So Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains that the conversation was something like this. The gopis are saying, why can't you just leave our clothes on the bank of the river and go away? And Krishna says, well, there are so many of you that if I do that, some girls might take the clothes that belong to another one of you. The gopis say, come on, we are honest and we never would steal the property of another person. Krishna says, okay, if that's true, then just come out and get your clothes. What's the difficulty? Then uh, uh, when, when, when the gopis saw that Krishna was determined, then they became even more filled with loving ecstasy. Although embarrassed, they were overjoyed to receive such attention from Krishna. He was joking with them as if they were his wives or girlfriends. Because remember, a boy would never joke with a girl like that unless it was his wife or a girlfriend. So the way he's joking with them too. So it's not just about, you know, getting their clothes to see them, but it's, it's the whole mood, the whole, you know, the conversation, the, the playful kind of mood, teasing and joking and laughing and talking. And all of that is just like something that only very intimate partners do. So um, he was joking with them as if they were his wives or girlfriends. And the Gobi's only desire was to achieve such a relationship with him. So they were feeling like already this vow has come true, like immediately. As soon as we got in the water, uh, goddess Katyayani has fulfilled our desire. At the same time, they were embarrassed to be seen naked by him, but they were laughing. Uh, they were laughing at him and they were also, they started to joke among themselves. So they turned towards each other. They're all standing there in the water. And then one gopi saying, oh, you go first, and then let's see what Krishna does if he plays some trick on you, and then we'll see what he does and decide if we're coming out or not. So like that, they're trying, you go first. No, you go first. Oh, look, he's looking at you. No, he's calling your name, <laughs> like that. So, yeah. And uh, it says that when Krishna was talking to the gopis like this, then his joking words completely captivated their minds. Uh, but still, they're in the water shivering. So Krishna says, uh, if you girls don't come out, come here, then uh, I'm going to get your garments. I'm going to get your saris and things, and I'm going to tie them to the branches and make a hammock and just swing. And I'm going to invite all my friends here to come swing in your in swings made out of your clothes. And then he says, I've been awake all night and I'm getting tired. So I'm just going to lie down in the hammock and go to sleep and wait for you to decide what you're going to do. And then the gopis are saying, Krishna, you know your cows, they always want green grass and now they've wandered off into a cave and it might be dangerous there. God knows there might be a bear in that cave that's gonna kill all your cows. So you better go there and <laughs> take care of your cows and leave us alone. And uh, then Krishna says, well, what about you? You can't stay dallying all day in the water there. Don't you have household duties to do at home? Uh, don't be a disturbance to your parents like this. So the gopis say, Krishna, you got it all wrong. Our parents, my mother asked me, our mothers asked us to do this for the, the month. It's on their order that we're doing this vow. So we're not going to get in trouble. And then Krishna says, you know, you've been doing all these austerities. I, I think you've become very detached now from your families and even from the idea of getting married. <laughs> 
And just by seeing you, I'm also becoming uh, surprisingly detached from family life. I think I'm going to stay here for one month now and uh, execute the vow of dwelling in the clouds. <laughs> He's just being silly. He's up there in the tree. And if you are merciful to me, then I may come down uh, there with you and observe the vow of fasting in your company. So it's just, um, they're just being silly, that's all, playing with each other and laughing. So now the gopis are going to try to convince him. Krishna, don't be unfair. We know that you're the respectable son of Nanda and that you're honored by everyone in Braj. And you're also very dear to us. So please, you know, you're a respectable boy from a respectable family, then do the respectable thing, do the right thing and just give us back our clothes. We're suffering here. And then they try to get his sympathy by saying, oh, Shama Sundar, we're your maidservants and must do whatever you say, but give us back our clothing. You know, re religious principles. Uh, and if you don't give us our clothes, we'll have to tell the king. So please give them back. Then Krishna, he says, you say you're my maidservants. If that's true, then you need to do what I say. And I'm saying, come here with your innocent smiles and each one pick out her own clothes from me. Uh, otherwise, you're not getting them back. And even if you tell the king and the king becomes angry, what can he do? Because Krishna knows already, you know, his father is very um, soft with him. So whenever Krishna does any naughty behavior, you know, maybe Mother Yashoda is going to punish him by trying to tie him up or whatever like that. But Nandamraj never punishes him. <laughs> and Nandamraj is the king. So it's like, he's my father and I'm his pet son and he's not going to do anything at all. So you can complain to him all you want. So now finally, the gopis are there in the water and these, um, these uh, uh, loving exchanges between Krishna and the gopis, the, the joking words are just uh, making their love for him increase more and more and more. And then it gets to the point where the river just breaks through the dam. Their shyness is um, uh, obliterated <laughs> and the love for Krishna prevails and they come out of the water one by one. Of course, they're covering themselves. You know, they're covering the private parts of their body with their, with their hands and with their hair that's hanging down the front. So, but what to do? And then, uh, so Krishna's there. And uh, as we each one comes out, then she's like, okay, now give me back my clothes. And Krishna says, hmm, you know, uh, you shouldn't have bathed naked. You should always wear something, at least some simple garment when you're bathing in the Yamuna, because you know the Yamuna is a holy river. It's not just any river. You can't go in there just like it's you know your shower or something. You need to be respectful to Yamuna Devi. So now you girls by bathing naked have committed an offense and you need to um, uh, counteract that offense by raising your hands over your head like this and paying obeisances to me. <laughs> so this is like um, taking their uh, surrender to Krishna to the next level because now like they were trying to cover themselves with their hands, but now they have to put their hands up like this and bow down. And uh, yeah, that's like, you know, for these girls, the, the, the purpose is for aristocratic girls like the gopis, this was worse than death. <laughs> and yet they decided to give up everything for the pleasure of Krishna. Krishna wanted to see the power of their love for him. And he was completely satisfied by their unalloyed devotion. In fact, uh, the, the Acharya's comment that uh, Krishna, he wanted to, he actually, his desire was not just to fulfill the gopis' desire, but he had his own desire. And that was that he also was attracted to the gopis and he wanted to give himself body, mind, and soul uh, to them. But he had to see whether they were willing to reciprocate, whether they were willing to give themselves to him uh, to the same degree that he wanted to give himself to them. So he was testing uh, their surrender. And when he saw that they were fully surrendered, then he also reciprocally surrendered to them. <laughs> he agreed to. Uh, become like a like a you know a puppet in their hands later on basically so 
Text 20 says, Thus the young girls of Vrindavan, considering what Lord Achyuta had told them, accepted that they had suffered a fall down from their vow by bathing naked in the river, but they still desired to successfully complete their vow. Yeah, because they're thinking, oh no, we offended uh, Yamuna Devi, and maybe all the results of this vow are going to be lost because of the offense. It's like, you know, Vaishnava Aparad can destroy um, our spiritual advancement. So they're worried that the whole thing is going to be null and void now that they've committed this offense. So, um, so yeah, since they desired to successfully complete their vow, and since Lord Krishna is himself the ultimate result of all pious activities, they offer their obeisances to him to cleanse away their sins. And uh, in the purport here, this very important point is made about um, the glories of the gopis, that they basically um, gave up everything for Krishna. They gave up their family traditions. They gave up their traditional morality. Uh, they gave up their shyness. Which um, was their, which was a girl's greatest virtue and and ornament, and uh, it says that the gopi's surrender is the perfection of all religion. And Srila Prabhupada, this is a quote here from the Krishna book. The gopis were all simple souls, and whatever Krishna said, they took to be true. In order to be free from the wrath of Varuna Dev, as well as to fulfill the desired end of their vows and ultimately to please the worshipful Lord Krishna, they immediately abided by his order. Thus, they became the greatest lovers of Krishna and his most obedient servitors. Nothing can compare to the Krishna consciousness of the gopis. Actually, the gopis did not care for Varuna or any other demigod. So, yeah, Varuna is the demigod of the water. So Krishna is telling you offended Varuna. They didn't really care what the demigods, uh, about the demigods. They only wanted to satisfy Krishna. So their surrender was just for Krishna. So then as they came out, Krishna um, delivered uh, the clothes to them uh, one by one. And, uh, and they got dressed. But even after they got dressed, they didn't go anywhere. They just stayed standing there. And now that they had you know, they put their clothes back on and everything, they, although they had broken their, given up their shyness temporarily just to get the clothes back, they all became shy again. And they kind of like were standing all close to each other and sort of, looking down at the ground and, and uh, not sure what to do next <laughs> because this situation was very unprecedented that they were in a secluded place with Krishna. They didn't really know. Uh, they were kind of stunned, like how to, what to do now, like how to deal with this situation. Yeah, that's what it says here. The gopis were addicted to associating with their beloved Krishna and thus they became captivated by him. Thus, even after putting their clothes on, they did not move. They simply remained where they were, shyly glancing at him. Then the Supreme Lord understood the determination of the gopis in executing their strict vow. The Lord also knew that the girls desired to touch his lotus feet. And thus Lord Damodar Krishna spoke to them as follows. So yeah, he, he knew that the gopis, they, did, they were very happy to have him there and to be talking to him. But the gopis really had a very strong desire to to touch Krishna, to embrace Krishna, to, you know, interact with him uh, personally. And so Krishna says, Oh, saintly girls, I understand that your real motive in this austerity has been to worship me. That intent of yours is approved by me, and indeed, it must come to pass. So he's assuring them that, yes, we are going to be together. <laughs> you have achieved me. It's just a question of time now, because we have to wait for the the right time for these things to happen. Uh, so he says, he continues, the desire of those who fix their minds on me does not lead to material desire for sense gratification. Just as barley corns burned by the sun and then cooked can no longer grow into new sprouts. So by making this statement, Krishna is, um, he's declaring basically that the gopi's desire for his association is not uh, is nothing to do with mundane lust. There's no material lust, lusty desire um, in the hearts of the gopis. They're completely pure, and they just want to um, serve Krishna in the mood that they know he wants to be served in, which is conjugal rasa, 
because Krishna is Akila Rasamrita Murti. He's the, the um, form, the embodiment of all 12 rasas. And uh, he, the jewel of all ra rasas, Sarva Rasa Sar, is um, the uh, Ujvala Ras or um, conjugal Ras. And so they know that Krishna wants to enjoy this relationship and they are suitable ones to, for him to enjoy the relationship with. So they want to serve him in that way. They want to give him pleasure in that mood according to his desire. So that's, that's their mentality. And Krishna says that if somebody has um, attraction for him, although it may appear to be lust, it's just like a, a, a barley corn. It's just like a seed that's been uh, cooked. So, you know, if you have a seed, like let's say you have a chickpea. So <laughs> a chickpea is a seed. If you put that in the ground, you're gonna, it's gonna sprout and it's gonna grow, you know, a, a legume plant and it's gonna produce uh, pods and you're gonna get chickpeas. So, or any kind of pea, any kind of seed. But if you take that chickpea uh, and boil it, cook it, then if you plant it, even if you put fertilizer water, nothing's gonna happen because it's, it's been, uh, inside of it has been like denatured. It can't grow anymore. So in the same way, the um, attraction of the gopis towards Krishna, although it, it looks like lust in the same way that the cooked chickpea looks like a chickpea seed, uh, but, um, that cooked chickpea is never going to grow into a, is never going to produce a plant. So in the same way that it looks like lust, but it's it's not going to um, produce any kind of lustful feelings. There's not going to be any desire for sense gratification in their hearts ever, because they're completely pure due to their attraction being oriented towards Krishna. So this is the way that we purify our hearts in Krishna consciousness. The process of bhakti yoga is based on this principle that whatever desires we have, we try to dovetail them uh, in the service of Krishna. So, you know, if you want to play music, then play music for Krishna. If you want to, you know, be a painter, then paint for Krishna. Whatever you want to do, just do it for Krishna and that desire will become uh, purified. And whatever... Um, qualities we have even our faults we try to use them in krishna's service then they'll get purified like um, you know hanuman was angry and he set lanka on fire and, but it was all for the purpose of saving mother sita and bringing her back to ram eventually so his anger was purified by being engaged in krishna's service like that so then he tells them uh, go now girls and return to vraj in other words, now you now just go home. Uh, your desire is fulfilled. In other words, consider me your husband. <laughs> so you can just imagine when he said that, the gopis are probably like, you know, clapping their hands and smiling very brightly. And it gets better. He says, uh, uh, in my company, you will enjoy the coming nights. So he's promising them that... Um, uh, in a short time from now, we're going to get together at night and we're going to enjoy each other's company the way that husband and wife enjoy each other's company at night. He says, after all, this was the purpose of your vow to worship goddess Katyayan, O pure hearted ones. So he says, he again emphasizes this point, O pure hearted ones, that there's no mundane lust. So Shukadeva Goswami says, thus instructed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, the young girls, their desire now fulfilled, could bring themselves only with great difficulty to return to the village of Raj, meditating all the while upon Krishna's lotus feet. So it was very difficult for them to <laughs> peel themselves away from Krishna's association after all that endeavor to get him and all the um, thrilling uh, experience they just had with him. And after the promise he just made, because you can imagine that they're now very impatient for those nights to come. And uh, we're going to hear about that in the following chapters. But for now, they're going home and they're going to just uh, uh, harbor and cherish that experience that they just had deep within their hearts. And uh, when they see each other, they're going to 
uh, look at each other with knowing glances, but when they're with anyone else, <laughs> then it's completely serious. Nothing happened. So that's uh, the gopis. And so somebody might, uh, you know, Krishna, for somebody who has sort of mundane consciousness and thinks that Krishna is an ordinary boy and that these gopis are ordinary girls, then this um, pastime of Krishna stealing the gopis' clothes can appear to be very um, bad. <laughs> you know, it looks really bad. Like, I mean, uh, I know that um, if I was bathing in a holy river and some man came and stole my clothes and told me that, you know, I have to come out naked if I want to get my clothes back and bow down to him, I would just be praying to Lord Nisingadev to finish him off quick. <laughs> I wouldn't be um please and i definitely wouldn't be uh worshiping him and you know so if we think of if we try to put ourselves our conditioned selves uh in you know if we see it through the through our own um the eyes of our own false ego basically then it looks inappropriate it looks terrible it looks manipulative um you know it looks like you know classic male chauvinism where the man comes and you know makes the women you know sort of like um uses his strength or whatever to outsmart them and and just sort of exploit them and make them do what he wants but um actually it's not that krishna is doing what he he's not exploiting the gopis to do what he wants but he's actually going out of his own way to do what they want to fulfill their desire and we can see by the results also is that the gopis aren't actually annoyed. They're not actually um, angry at all, but they're just becoming more and more happy. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just really blissful throughout the whole episode. And their love for him is growing more and more. And they're feeling like everything has come to fruition in such a wonderful and perfect way. So fully satisfied. And uh, these gopis also, they're not, uh, you know, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and the gopis are uh, his eternal consorts, their eternal constitutional positions to be together. So they're already, they, they already have the relationship. It's just that um, Yogamaya is acting in such a way as to cover it. And so now it's being restored to this pastime. All right. Any questions out there? Prabhupada, um, um, why does the gopi wants, gopis wants their, uh, I mean, like, they all want to get married with Krishna, but why do they want to um, do that, like, secretly? I mean, they could have asked their parents, right? I mean, they could, but the thing is that, um, I mean, they can't all marry Krishna. <laughs> you know, Krishna's not going to marry every girl in the village, is one thing. Uh, another thing is that, um, uh, I mean, they're not sure if their mother, if their parents, you know, usually like the parents at those times would arrange the marriage. So, uh, they don't want to wait and see who the parents are going to choose. It, it wasn't that the girls would select their own husband. They would do their part by doing this vow and they would, you know, just wait for the, the parents to. Um, and, and also, isn't it odd, like, like many women are wanting to get married with like a single person, like, like they have, like women generally have this kind of, uh, thing right like um, my husband belongs to me that's it yeah so how come like they all wanted single person but they at the same time they all don't have any um you know kind of rivalry between them yeah because their hearts are pure so they don't uh, and because the person that they all love is krishna so um you know krishna is not limited like a like a normal husband is so he he can reciprocate with them 
all equally to their full satisfaction. Generally, like if there's an ordinary man and he has, you know, numerous wives, then, uh, you know, he's limited. He can only be with one wife at a time. And uh, his tendency is to have, you know, a preference for one over the other. And so he'll be more affectionate and more attentive to one than the other. And then it's natural that the other one will get jealous and envious and like that and hate the other wives. But with Krishna, it's not like that because Krishna is unlimited. So we'll, we'll see how he expands himself to be with each gopi in such a way that she thinks that Krishna is only with her. And so everyone's completely satisfied, like beyond their expectation with Krishna. Okay, thank you. All right. Any question, Christina? No, thanks very much. <laughs> okay, we'll wrap it up then. So then, Shrimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Shri Prabhupada ki jai. Jai. Shri Prabhupada ki 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 jai.